Okay, Hare Krishna. Uh, so today we will uh, we will start uh, hearing more about the creation of the universe. So the next few sessions will be on this topic, the creation of the universe. So today uh, we will study about the blueprint of the universe, right? So this is uh, chapter 3.6, six, six uh, sixth chapter of the third canto. Today is just one chapter. So we'll start from here. That's the first slide. So chapter uh, 3.5, it uh, narrates how Lord Mahavishnu created uh, the, the five basic material elements, right? It's this process of creation of ether, air, fire, water, and art. And also he created the properties of these elements, touch, uh, sound, form, taste, smell, and also the uh, five uh, predomin uh, predominating deities of these uh, elements. So the function of these deities is to assist the Lord in the creation of the universe. And they were eager to do so. Yeah, let's create the universe. However, they saw that they were not capable of doing it. They wanted to create the universe. They understood that their function was to serve the Lord, right? Uh, uh, contributing in the creation of the universe. But they saw that they were incapable of creating the, the universe by themselves. So they started praying to the Lord, right? So great part of the last chapter were these prayers of the deities of the elements. So it happens that all that the material elements and even the predominant predominating deities of these elements, they have no power to create for themselves, right? Uh, they, they are just like factory workers, right? They have no ability to create a car alone, right? Unless there is a project, there is a, mina, a manager to guide them, like right? nothing will be done, right? Like the workers, they can figure out everything by themselves. So similarly, the predominating deities of the material elements, they can uh, only offer their work in manipulating you know, the building blocks of the material uh, manifestation, right? Uh, that, but that's just part of the work. For the cosmos to manifest, a project is necessary, as well as the competent uh, managers that can oversee these constructions. Uh, and both things, they have to be provided by the Lord. So the sixth chapter, we will see how the Supreme Lord provides these two components that are missing. So the process of creation can be uh, completed, right? And uh, so the sixth chapter describes the creation of the universal form. And at first... It may appear that it is describing the same process of primary creation that we already studied in the second canto. First time that we we read this chapter, usually we have this idea that, oh my God, again, the same explanation. I already studied this in the second canto, right? But it's not like that. That's a misconception. Uh, what is described here is the process of secondary creation, or in other words, uh, the creation of the physical universe with all the planets and all the different beings, different living beings and so on. All this work that you know, we see around us that is done by Lord Brahma, resulting in you know, the whole universe that we can see, the physical universe that we can see. However, this chapter, the sixth chapter, it describes this creation from the point of view of the Lord, right? Describing the Lord's involvement in this process. So Brahma is there, but he's just part of this process, right? He's part of this process. Uh, during this description that we will see in this chapter, you can imagine that Brahma is there, he's doing his work, but Brahma is not directly mentioned in this chapter uh, because he's just part of the process, right? This chapter is analyzing things from the perspective of the Lord. So in the following chapters, we will see the same process explained in more detail from the perspective of Brahma. 
right? So, and, and this may sound like very complicated, like that, wait, but why, you know, same explanation from one side and from the other side, from the top, from the bottom, uh, but it's actually quite natural. So, for example, imagine the uh, the story of Henry Ford opening his car factory like one, oh, like one century ago, and producing the Ford Model T, right? That was the uh, first car that was produced. So if we tell the story from the point of view of no, Mr. Ford, uh, it may appear that the factory appeared more or less automatically, right? He had an idea, he created the project of a car, he figured out how to mass produce it, he got some money, he hired a few people, he organized it then, and then eventually the factory became a reality and start, started producing cars, right? So it looks like it's just out of his you know, desire, the car, uh, the factory appeared. Uh, so we can understand that people were working there, uh, but we don't. You know, when the story is told from the point of the owner, we don't hear so many, so much about them, right? We don't hear so much about the individual workers. Only maybe the main managers are mentioned. But if we tell the same story from the perspective of the manager, the manager of on the factory then this story will be very different, right? In this case, uh, the struggles of this manager in understanding the project, you know, organizing the workers, overseeing the production, correcting mistakes, and so on, uh, they will become prominent, right? And the work of you know, Mr. Ford will be in the background, right? We will not hear so much about him. And if we tell the same story from the point of view of like some ordinary worker, the focus will be again different, right? Uh, it will be centered on the view of someone who understands just a small part of the workings of the factory, who sees Mr. Ford as some kind of you know mythical figure who just pays his salary. He will see the factory as some kind of you know magic concoction <laughs> that he can't fully understand. He just sees that you know metal is entering one side and cars are coming on the other side. And uh, no, something magical that he can't understand. He will see the manager as someone who he doesn't understand very well either, but he needs to follow without argument. So we see that according to the point of view, the, the, the story will sound different, but it's not a different story. It's the same story, right? So in the same way, the Shirmad Bhagavatam, it tells us the story of the creation of the universe from uh, different perspectives. So here in the sixth chapter, we have the creation explained from the side of Lord Mahavishnu, right? And later, we will have the same process explained from the perspective of Lord Brahma. And then later, from the perspective of different demigods, you know, different people who are living the universe and, you know, trying to figure out <laughs> what is happening. And, uh, uh, you know, we will hear their respective struggles, you know, to play their respective roles in the creation and maintenance of the universe and so on. And this process of studying the same story from different perspectives, it allows us to better understand it, right, Jai? And then we have the next one, that is the Lord enters the material elements, right? Haribo. So... Uh, so verse okay. So verse three point six three three six two, right? This verse describes like second second verse of the sixth chapter. It describes how after hearing the prayers of the predominating predominating deities of the elements, the Lord entered the material elements. Right. So quote, the supreme powerful lords then simultaneously entered into the 23 elements with the goddess Kali, his external energy, who alone amalgamates all the different elements, like, unquote. So this verse, it actually has a lot of information. First of all, from, from where did we get 23 elements, right? The last chapter describes the creation of just five. So this is just a different way to count it, because this list of 23 elements that is mentioned here, 
it includes the Mahatattva, the false ego, the minds, and then the properties of the five elements and also the different senses. So all of these things actually they were created in the previous process. It's just being counted in a different way. So Prabhupada lists these uh, 23 elements as one, uh, Mahatattva, two, false ego, three, sound, tausch, form, uh, taste, smell, art, water, fire, right? We have 10 already. Then air, sky, eye, ear, nose, tongue, skin, hands, leg, like right? uh, leg, evacuating organs, so senses, then genital speech and mind. See, 23. It's just a, a different way to count. So, and all of these, they were created in the previous stage. So the second point is that the simple existence of the elements, it doesn't make the a cosmic creation viable. It's just like, you know, if you have a, a, just a pile of bricks, it's not sufficient to build to for a house to be built, right? So the bricks will not make the house by, by, by themselves, right? So the Lord entered into the elements as Paramatma, and that's what made the creation possible, right? So as the Lord entered the elements, he brought with him uh, Goddess Kali, right? His external energy. So we tend to imagine uh, Kali as the material energy itself, but this verse, uh, it defines Kali as a superior energy that controls the elements, just like a soul that enters a body, right? So the Kali is not the elements themselves. Kali is a superior energy that controls the elements. It's like the predominant deity of the cosmic creation. So as the verse mentions, she amalgamates, or in other words, she merges, she combines, she unites and blends <laughs> all the different elements uh, creating uh, different combinations of these elements. So in other words, our, uh, although the Lord is the one who gives uh, the, the energy, right? Kali is the one who makes uh, things happen, right? So Lord empowers, Kali is the one who works. But who exactly is Kali, right? And Prabhupada mentions this, that, quote, Time, therefore, is the energy of the Lord and acts in her own way by the direction of the Lord. This energy is called Kali and is represented by the dark, destructive goddess generally worshipped by persons influenced by the modes, mode of darkness or ignorance in material existence. So this is also confirmed uh, by the verse itself, Kala Sangyang uh, Tada Devin, the goddess named Kali or time. So in other words, Kali is the same as Kala, the eternal time or the material time, right? Uh, before, right, in the what we studied in the previous chapters, uh, time was present as an element. But uh, it was uh, that it was an el time was an element, right? It was mixed with the Mahatattva and the three material modes uh, to create other material elements. But at this stage, uh, Kala becomes fully manifested as a personality, right? And that's Goddess Kali, who guides the permutation of the different elements into the uh, material creation. And it's also words, uh, uh, nothing, that Goddess Kali is also different from Kali, right? The predominant, predominating deity of Kali Yuga, who met Kali. Uh, Parikshit. Just the name is similar, right? Kali is some is one thing. Uh, is actually Kali, and then we have Kali, that is the you know deity of Kali Yuga. But that these are two different persons. They don't have anything to do with each other. Just the name is similar. And then there is another. Uh, uh, so we can better capture the depthness of the philosophical points that are being discussed here by reading again the text and the connected part of the purport. So we'll just quote here. Uh, so, quote, The supreme powerful Lord then simultaneously entered into the 23 elements with Goddess Kali, his external energy, who alone amalgamates all the different elements. And then purport. The ingredients of matter are counted as 23. 
The total material energy for seagull, sound, touch, form, taste, smell, art, water, fire, air, sky, eye, ear, nose, tongue, skin, hand, leg, evacuating organ, genital, speech, and mind. All are combined together by the influence of time and are again dissolved in the, in the course of time. Time, therefore, is the energy of the Lord and acts in her own way by the direction of the Lord. This energy is called Kali and is represented by the dark, destructive goddess generally worshipped by persons influenced by the mold of darkness or ignorance in material existence. In the Vedic hymn, this process is described as Mula Praktir, uh, Avikritir Mahadaya Mahadaya Mahadaya. A prakriti vrikritaya sapta sodasaktas tu vikaro na prakriti na vrikriti purushaha. So the energy which acts as material nature in a combination of 23 ingredients is not the final source of creation. The Lord enters into the elements and applies his energy uh, called uh, Kali. Right? Haribo. Uh, so, okay, so that's how Prabhupada explains it. And then we go to the next slide. Uh, so, the step mentioned uh, here, like the Lord entering into the elements together with his energy, includes the formation of the shells of the material universe, right? And the Lord entering into each of them as Garbhodakashai Vishnu and Shirodakashai Vishnu. So, and of course, as Shirodakashai Vishnu, as we studied already, the Lord enters into everything, right? Up to the atoms, that's Paramatma. Then there is the next step, that is the activation of the souls who are previously sleeping inside the body of Mahavishnu and were injected into the material creation, right? And this is next verse, uh, 363. Thus, when the personality of Godhead entered into the elements by his energy, all the living entities were enlivened into different activities, just as one is engaged in his work after awakening from sleep. So the question here is that Apart from the physical body, we also have our subtle body, right? Which includes our material desires, remembrances from past lives, uh, stored in the unconscious mind, and so on. Many different things. So apart from the subtle body, there are also the results of our karma, right? That follows us from, from one body to another. However, when the universes are destroyed, and the souls they go to sleep uh, inside the body of Mahavishnu, all these coverings they are destroyed, right? And the only the pure soul uh, goes to the to the body of Mahavishnu, right? So body is part of the material creation, and thus when the material creation is destroyed, the subtle body is also destroyed. Uh, anyway, uh, although the subtle body the material desires, the karma, and so on, they are destroyed. The Lord remembers all of this for each and every conditioned soul, right? So the subtle body is destroyed, but still the Lord remembers everything. And then when the material creation is again activated, the Lord restores the subtle body and the karma of each soul exactly as it was before. And of course, this allows the souls to continue their activities from the point they stopped, like in the last creation, just like someone, you know, awakening in the morning. So the ones who are who were human beings, they take again, you know, birth as human beings. The ones who were animals or plants, they continue on the same path and so on. Right. At the same time, uh, especially qualified souls, they are selected to occupy the posts of Brahma, Manu, Indra, and other you know, very high positions. And in case there is no sufficient qualified souls to any of this position, then the Lord himself comes as an incarnation to play the role. Right? Uh, so he did that in the reign of the first Manu, for example. He became Indra. Uh, so, as Prabhupada explains in his purport, quote, 
The unconscious sleeping stage of the living entity just after the partial or total dissolution of the creation is wrongly accepted as the final stage of life by some less intelligent philosophers. After the dissolution of the partial material body, a living entity remains unconscious for only a few months and after the total dissolution of the material creation, he remains unconscious for many millions of years. But when the creation is again revived, he is awakened to his work by the Lord. The living entity is eternal, and the wakeful state of his consciousness manifested by activities is his natural condition of life. He cannot stop acting while awake, and thus he acts according to his diverse desires. When his desires are trained in the transcendental service of the Lord, his life becomes perfect and he is promoted to the spiritual sky to enjoy eternal awakened life. Right? Haribo. Very beautiful, right? And then, next slide, the process of creation starts. Jai, right? Now the big show will start. <laughs> so, up to this point, uh, the shells, like the no, the balls of the material universes, they were created, right? The Lord entered them as Garbhadakashai Vishnu and Kshirodakashai Vishnu. The material energy was activated, the souls awakened from their long slumber, right? And now the, pro the process of, the, of creation of the material manifestation starts, right? So the first uh, step is the manifestation of the universal form. Uh, the blueprint of the universe that serves as a foundation, or we can also imagine as like a project uh, for the creation of Brahma, right? And this is described on verses 4 and 5. Uh, quote, When the 23 principal elements were set in action by the will of the Supreme, the gigantic universal form or uh, Vishwarupa body of the Lord, like the universal form, came into existence. As the Lord, in his plenary po portion, entered into the elements of the universal creation, they assumed, uh, no, they transformed into the gigantic form from which all the planetary systems and all movable and immovable creations rest. Right? Unquote. So this subtle universal form uh, was created uh, long before, right? Uh, like, uh, like in the process we studied in the second canto, the second canto describes the creation of this universal form, uh, this Virat Rupa. At this stage, the form just became manifested. Uh, like in this stage that we are seeing now, the form becomes manifest inside each material universe, right? So in the second canto, the Lord created the universal form as like the initial project. Now, this initial, this universal form appears inside each universe and it serves like a foundation for the creation of Brahma. And then Brahma appears from the novel of Lord Vishnu and this leads to the situation described in the ninth uh, chapter of the second canto, right? Brahma awakens in complete darkness on top of the lotus flower, and he was not able to trace, you know, the source of it, right? He understood that he was supposed to create the universe, but he could not understand uh, what to do, how to do it. And although the subtle universal form was there, the project was there, was already manifested, Brahma could not see it. So he didn't, he couldn't understand what he was supposed to do. And then at this point, Brahma heard the syllables ta and pa, right? Ta, pa, austerity, uh, pronounced by the Lord, and he engaged in meditation, right? Brahma then meditated for 1,000 celestial years. At the end of this period, Brahma received the darshan of the Lord, and finally he started the process of creation, right? The, so, uh, so this description from the second canto describes the creation in the current day of Brahma, right? It doesn't necessarily happen exactly the same way in all days of Brahma, right? Uh, this particular day, 
the Padma Kalpa, it is special because it follows the total devastation that happens at the end of the first half of the life of Brahma. Normally, when Brahma awakens at the beginning of his day, the process is simpler than what is described here because the material elements, as well as the upper planets like Maharloka, Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, Brahma Loka, they are there already because these planets they survive, they survive the partial devastation. But in the, the in the first day of Brahma, as well as in the first day of the second day of the second half of the life of Brahma, then he needs to start from zero. Everything is completely destroyed. And then next slide. Okay, we continue here. So. Apart from being uh, the current day, another reason for the Srimad Bhagavatam describing the Padma Kalpa instead of some other day of Brahma is because on this particular day, Krishna appears on his original form uh, to Lord Brahma uh, after his meditation, right? So that's the great day that Brahma sees Govinda directly. So as mentioned in the Gopalata Upanishad, Brahma, he practices devotional service for the first half of his life. And then finally, on the first day of the second half, the Lord agrees uh, to reveal himself to him, right? And allows him to see uh, the spiritual world. So in this way, from this description, we learn that Brahma meditated from 1,000 celestial years at the beginning of the current day, right? Okay, he, he was meditating quite a long time. So what happened during this period? And this is described on verse 6, quote, The gigantic Virat Purusha, known as Hiranmaya, lived for 1,000 celestial years on the water of the universe, and all the living entities lay with him, right? Unquote. So while Brahma was doing this meditation, uh, the cosmic creation could not proceed. So everything just stopped. Nothing happened. And thus, the subtle universal form uh, with all the souls just remained manifested inside you know, the shell of the universe, but nothing happened, right? So it, it's mentioned that the internal space of our universe, right? Our universe is like a ball, and then we have the coverings, and we have the internal space. So this internal space of our universe uh, half is filled with water, and that's the water where Garbhadaka Shai Vishnu rests. And the other half is open space where you know, the cosmic manifestation takes place, right? All the planets, everything is there. So the universal form uh, was present in this open space, right? So where the cosmic manifestation was later to be manifested. Uh, so it was just floating above the water. So in his purport uh, of this verse, Prabhupada, he systematizes these points. So uh, A, after the Lord entered each universe, as Garbhada Kashai Vishnu, right, he fills half of the universe with water. The other half is reserved for the creation of the universe, right? B, after the entrance of uh, Vishnu uh, within the universe, but before the process of creation, there was a period of 1,000 celestial years. And this corresponds to the meditation of Brahma, right? Then C, uh, all the souls who joined the material creation, they were divided amongst the different universes, right? And they had to wait until the respective Brahma in each of these universes, they, they, he appeared and performed his meditation, right? And then D, uh, Brahma is the first living being within the universe. And from him, all other, the dem all other demigods and living creatures are born, right? So these are the points that Prabhupada summarizes. And after the period of meditation of Brahma, the creation finally started, right? Haribo. And the beginning of the process is described on the seventh verse. So, quote, the total energy of the Mahatattva in the form of the gigantic Virat Rupa divided himself uh, by himself into the consciousness of the living entities, the life of activity and self-dedication, uh, which are subdivided into one, ten, and three, respectively. 
and we come to the next stage, the three sets of components of material creation, right? So, okay, so what is this one, three, and 10 that are mentioned here in this verse? So uh, during the process of creation, three components are manifested from the Virat Rupa, right? Actually three sets of components. Uh, the consciousness of the living entities, that's one, their activities, two, and their self-identification, right? So three things. So these three are divided into respectively one, uh, ten, and three components. So, okay, what are they? So first of all, uh, the consciousness of the living entity is called Gyana Shakti, and it is just one. It's just only one division, just one consciousness. Uh, it's one consciousness, but it changes over time according to one's desires and activities, his association and so on. You know, the, the consciousness may change, but it's always you know, one consciousness. Uh, so Prabhupada explains that originally every soul is Krishna conscious. And when the soul enters the material manifestation, however, this original consciousness is covered by a material consciousness that allows the soul to forget his original identity and become absorbed uh, in material activities, right? So in other words, there are two Gyana Shaktis, right? There is the original Gyana Shakti, or the original consciousness of the soul, which is spiritual and centered uh, on the service of Krishna. And then there is the material Gyana Shakti, or the material consciousness that covers the original consciousness of the soul. So the Gyana Shakti described in this verse is the material Gyana Shakti, right? That is created and attributed to the soul as part of the material creation. The original spiritual consciousness is not mentioned here because it's not material, right? Here it's speaking only about the material coverings. So, uh, in his Paramatma Sandarbha, okay, now we are going a little far. It's okay. In his Paramatma Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami he explains that, quote, though, uh, though it is established that the Jiva is naturally a knower, his knowing that he is a body uh, by ignorance is also the Jiva's knowledge. But because of this, of its relation to ignorance, it is not natural to the Jiva. Rather, it's a distortion. Anyway, he is making this point that this material Gyana Shakti is something external, it's something that is not natural, it's not part of the soul. So, in other words, this material consciousness that we have now is not natural to, to the Jiva, right? The Jiva is by nature Krishna conscious. Rather, this material consciousness is received uh, together with the package of mind, intelligence, and ego that makes our intelligence in this material world possible, right? And this leads like to the like terrifying <laughs> realization that our, our current consciousness is not our real consciousness. What we are now is not what we are in reality, right? We are, no, that's not what we really are, right? And that's precisely the point that Prabhupada makes uh, in his books, when he describes Krishna consciousness as the process of uh, reestablishing the original consciousness of the soul. Like, it's not that we are uh, the material consciousness and we need to, you know, somehow or other acquire a spiritual consciousness, as believed, you know, by some people. But rather, it is that uh, the reality is that we are the spiritual consciousness and we need to somehow or other get rid of this material consciousness that is covering this real consciousness, right? Uh, so Prabhupada explains it by uh, describing material existence as some kind of dreaming state. The real consciousness of a person is exhib exhibited when he is in the awakened state, right? And not in the you know, dreaming state. And the process to recover one's real consciousness is to wake up, right? So that's the point. So we are now like sleeping. That's not our real consciousness. We need to wake up and then we will see, you know, we will come back to our real, uh, full, complete consciousness. Uh, and then once we 
uh, come in contact with the material energy and we are covered by the material Gyana Shakti, the process of returning to our original consciousness is by practicing Krishna consciousness, starting from the consciousness we have now. Right, so by so that's the process to go back right to what we are. So by following the process of hearing and chanting, meditating on the past times of the Lord, serving and so on, this material consciousness can be purified, and our original consciousness gradually awakened. Right, so the Lord creates this material manifestation just to give us an uh, uh, opportunity to do so, to go back to Godhead, right? So that's why sometimes it's said that the jiva is not never with, was never before with Krishna, because it depends on what we call us, right? If we call the jiva the soul, the pure soul, then of course originally the soul was with Krishna. But when you consider the current consciousness, the conditioned consciousness, the combination of the soul with false ego, mind, intelligence, uh, and desires, and so on. When you call, you refer to this combination as the jiva, then it was never with Krishna because, you know, these material coverings, of course, they were never outside of the material universe. So in this sense, it's sometimes described that the jiva was never with Krishna. This material consciousness was never with Krishna. But once we enter into the material universe and we acquire this material consciousness, the way to go back is that we need to practice Krishna consciousness with this material consciousness, become Krishna conscious in this current identity that we have now. And then when this process is complete, then we can go back we become free, right? The material consciousness becomes like one with the spiritual consciousness, and we can understand who we really are. So that's the process. Uh, and there is a quote here from Prabhupada. The consciousness of the soul becomes polluted by the material atmosphere, and thus various activities are exhi exhibited in the false ego of bodily identification. These various activities are described in, in Bhagavad Gita 241 as Bahu Shaka. Uh, Bahu Shaka hiya anantas cha budayo vyava sainam. So the conditioned soul is bewildered by various activities for want, like for lack of pure consciousness. In pure consciousness, the activity is one. Is one. The consciousness of the individual soul becomes one with the Supreme Consciousness when there is complete uh, synthesis between the two, right? Jai. Uh, and then we go to the next verse, continuation here. So then we have the second group that, that are the activities, right? So the activities connected with the material consciousness, they are divided into 10 because they are performed through the vital air. And the vital air has 10 divisions. So Prabhupada explains these 10 divisions in his purport to uh, 369. So he says there, quote, The 10 kinds of air are described as follows. The main air passing through the nose in breathing is called prana. The air which passes through the rectum as evacuated bodily air is called apana. The air which adjusts the foodstuff within the stomach and with sometimes sounds as belching is called samana. The air which passes through the throat and the stoppage of which constitutes suffocation is called udana air. And the total air which circulates throughout the entire body is called viana air. Subter than these five uh, airs, there, is, there are others also. That which facilitates the opening of the eyes, mouth, etc. is called Naga air. The air which increases appetite is called Krikara air. The air which helps contraction is called Kurma air. The air which helps relaxation by opening the mouth wide by yawning is called Devadatta air. And the air which helps sustenance is called Dananjaya air. So, uh, so this is the end of the quote. The end of the quote of Prabhupada. So this is Prabhupada's explanation of the 10 divisions of the vital air. So the, the vital air 
is what factually maintains the material body and allows us to perform actions, right? When uh, the it, without the vital air, we will just drop that. So in the Taitiri Upanishad, it's mentioned that the pranamaya, the vital air, it exists inside the anamaya, the physical body, and it sustains it. So uh, the vital air, actually the subtle part of the vital air, is also responsible for carrying the subtle body, right, together with the soul, from one uh, physical body to the other, following the direction of Paramatma. Okay, so then we have the activities, B, and now we have C, that is self-identification. This is divided into three, Adjatmika, Adibautika, and Adidaivika. So, Adhyatmika means the material identification with the body and mind, right? Adhibautika means identification with material objects, situations, family members, and so on, right? All these different, uh, different identifications. And so from the idea that we are the body comes the idea that we are connected with people and objects connected with the body, right? Thus, uh, uh, one thinks that he's a citizen of a certain nation, part of a certain family, a member of a certain social class, the owner of different objects, the son or daughter of a certain person, the husband or wife of another, and so on. And all these material identifications are part of the Adibautica identification, right? They are together. Finally, there is the Adidaivica identification, that is the superior identification. That's the identification with our original position as a servant of the Lord. So by the process of Krishna consciousness, we can gradually transfer our consciousness from the Adhyatmika and Adibautika stages of consciousness to the uh, Adhidaivika stage, right? We can come to Krishna consciousness. And then in text nine, uh, the universal form is also described as being the three, the ten, and the one, in the sense of being the body, the mind, and the senses, right? Uh, so, uh, so the three is the body, mind, and senses, the ten are the ten divisions of the vital air, and the heart is the one, which is the seat of the soul and the center of the energies of the body, right? So this, so this explanation of three. Uh, 1, 3, and 10 has these two different meanings. In two different verses, it's explained in, mentioned in different senses, right? Uh, so anyway, the Virat Rupa, it includes everything that exists in the material universe. Therefore, you know, many similar analogies can be made. And then we have next topic, the Virat Rupa as an incarnation of the Lord. So text Eight continues the description of the universal form. So it says there, uh, quote, so you see, today we are going very slowly, right? All this time we saw only seven verses because, you know, <laughs> these verses, they're really, you know, philosophical. You know, so much information here in just a few words. So, okay, now we go to text eight. It, this, is, this continues the description of the universal form. So, quote, the gigantic universal form of the Supreme Lord is the first incarnation and plenary portion of the super soul. He is the self of an unlimited number of living entities, and in him rests the aggregate creation, which which thus flourishes. Okay, so if you if you didn't understand much of this verse, don't worry, you are not alone. It's not easy, but <laughs> now we will we will go little by little now. So as we studied in the third chapter of the first canto. Shirodakashai Vishnu, or the super soul, is the source of all the incarnations of the Lord who appear inside the universe, right? With the exception, of course, and Krishna and Balarama, uh, who are the original personality of Godhead and his first expansion. Krishna and Balaram, they are outside this. But the other incarnations, they all come from Paramatma, from Shirodakashai Vishnu. So the Virat Rupa appears... Uh, uh, right after Paramatma enters the universe, uh, before the creation of Brahma, right? So the universal form is thus the first incarnation that appears from Paramatma. Uh, and as an incarnation, it's considered uh, his uh, plenary portion, right? 
Krishna refers to it in the Bhagavad Gita when he mentions uh, Vista Byahan Idan Krishna says that with a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. So this means Paramatma, right? As Kshiroda Kashai Vishnu. So that is, however, uh, uh, no, uh, Kshiroda Kashai Vishnu expanding himself as the Virat Rupa, right? As the universal form. Uh, so there's you know, the fragment of the fragment of the fragment of Krishna's of Krishna's energy. There is, however, a difference between the universal form and uh, the different incarnations of the Lord, such as Varaha, Nishinha, etc. Uh, and the difference is the fact that all these different incarnations of the Lord, they appear in his, or, uh, in, in all these different incarnations, right? The Lord comes in his original spiritual body, right? They, these incarnations, they all are completely transcendental. But, the universal form is a material manifestation that is temporary and is composed of material elements, right? So the universal form is thus considered a form of the Lord, an incarnation of the Lord, because it, it is empowered by the Lord and made out of the energy of the, of the Lord. But it is different in nature from the transcendental form uh, of the Lord, right? Uh, so materialists, as well as impersonalists, they are attracted, they are captivated by this universal form, right? This uh, material manifestation. While devotees, they are attracted to the spiritual forms of the Lord, right? So this is another difference. And then verse 10 concludes this topic, quote, the Supreme Lord is the super soul of all the demigods entrusted with the task of constructing the cosmic manifestation, being thus prayed to by the demigods, he taught to himself and thus manifested the gigantic form for their understanding, right? The Virat Rupa, the universal form, unquote. So this whole description explains how the Lord answered the prayers of the predominant deities of the elements from chapter five, right? That is, the, the, there are these prayers there, here are the how the, the devotee answers these prayers. He answers these prayers by starting uh, the material creation, right? So the demigods they uh, manifested, right? The demigods of the elements they manifested their incapacity in creating the universe, and thus the Lord entered the material universe as Garbhadakasha and Shirodakasha Vishnu, bringing him the external energy. He manifested the Virat Rupa, created Brahma, and then Brahma used these five material elements, right, controlled by their respective deities to create the universe, right? Jai. And now, okay, so Brahma is creating, right? So you see, we are describing this process from the point of view of the Lord, of the point of view of Vishnu here, but this, uh, but Brahma is doing his work there, right? Brahma is, is working all the time. And then we have the creation of the demigods. So Maitreya then, he opens another topic uh, by explaining that the demigods, they were generated from the universal form. And this description may at first sound very, sound very similar to what we studied in the 10th chapter of the second canto, right? You read these verses uh, from the sixth chapter here, 3, 6, 11, 3, 6, uh, 12, and so on these uh, verses from the sixth chapter, and you read back uh, the verses from chapter 10 of, of second canto, and again, you may have the impression that, wait, uh, is, is speaking the same thing here in, in both places, why? But again, it's not like this, there is a difference, right? But let's see first the similarities. So for example, take verse uh, 10, uh, 2, 10, 19, for example, describes the creation of Agni, the demigod of fire, right? Uh, together with the faculty of speech controlled by him. So the verse says, when the Supreme uh, desired to speak, speeches were vibrated from the mouth. Then the controlling deity of fire was generated from the mouth. But when he was lying in the water, all these functions remained suspended. Okay. Then see similar description in verse 3, 6, 12, 
right? Uh, agony or heat separated from his mouth and all the directors of material affairs entered into their respective positions. By that energy, the living entity expressed himself in words. So you see, appears that is describing the same thing, right? The demigod of the fire, the mouth, and the capacity of speaking, right? And similarly, there is the creation of Mitra, and as, as well as the evacuating organ that is presided by him. So 2, 10, 27. Thereafter, after he desired to evacuate it, to evacuate the refuse of eatables, the evacuating whole anus and the sensory organ uh, thereof developed along with the controlling deity, Mitra. The sensory organ and the evacuating substance are both under the shelter of the controlling deity. And now on the third canto, 3, 6, 20. The evacuating channel separately became manifested manifest, and the director named Mitra entered into it with the partial organs of evacuation. Thus, the living entities are able to pass to an urine. Again, looks like he's describing the same thing, right? It's similar. But, you know, it, we come to why it's different uh, and why this description appears to up, up appears to appear two times in two different chapters. So we can see that at first the explanations, they look very similar. However, these two chapters, they describe different things. And that's why it's being described again. It's not the same thing. So the second canto describes the primary creation, right? When the Lord uh, created the universal form as an idea. And the third canto describes uh, the physical creation of Brahman, right? So that's the difference. One is the Lord creating the idea. Now is Brahma physically creating these deities and organs and activities. So we can see that verse 2, 10, 19, for example, describes the creation of the demigod of fire and the faculty of speech, and then concludes with the words Chattasya Suchi Ram Niroda Samajayata. However, all these functions remained suspended for a long time. So let's see, the Lord created the archetype of the demigod, right? And the function of speed, speech. Uh, but because there was no physical manifestation of the time, the functions remained suspended. It was just an idea, right? So in a gross example, it's more or less like writing a constitution and other laws and uh, treaties for governing a country while the country is not yet established, right? So you, you, you kind of prepare the idea how this country is going to work, but the country doesn't exist yet, right? It's just an idea that is going to be applied in the future. So the primary creation is more or less like this. So second canto describes this primary creation, the Lord created the idea, and now is described the process of creation uh, itself, like Brahma working under the supervision of the Lord. So when the Lord enters into the universe as Kshiroda Kashai Vishnu, uh, this universal form that is created in the second canto, it manifests each universe, right? Just like a project, right? That is used for the construction of a building. So Brahma receives this information about the universal form from inside the heart, and then he starts the process of creation, right? Giving physical forms to all uh, the different components of the of the universal form. And that's the physical creation that we see around us. So the individual forms of life are not exhaust exhaustively like mentioned in this description uh, because this description, it focuses on the components of these forms, which are considered uh, a more important step of the creation. So for example, it's described here the, the creation of the mouth, the hands, and so on, but not the creation of the individual bodies that you know use this mouth, hand, and so on. So to understand how it is so, uh, we can consider that once components, like we imagine parts like engines, tires, 
suspensions, electronics, and so on, right? Once, once when these parts are available, it's easy for a company to produce many different models of cars using these components, right? But if the company had to create everything from scratch, uh, then it would be practically impossible, right? So similarly, the process of creating the different species is not considered as important as creating the individual components that form their bodies, right? So yeah, that's how it's, it is uh, explained in the Bhagavad Gita, right? Quite an interesting way to consider. So in this way, the idea created by the Lord, right in the second canto, it becomes the physical manifestation of the universe. And the same process happens, you know, all over the cosmos, like in all the other uh, material universes. And here are the main points of this description. So, A, from the mouth of the universal form comes Agni, who presides over the speech of all beings of in the universe, right? Then B, uh, from the palate of, of the universal form, came Varuna, who preside, presides over the sense of taste. And under his supervision, the taste uh, of, for the sense of taste for all beings is created, right? And then C, from the nostrils of the universal form, came the Asvini Kumaras, and they preside over the sense of smell, right? Thanks to this, we can smell things. So everything that you smell, some you know, nice smell, you can thank the Lord for that. <laughs> Because it came, it came from him, right? We are seeing how he did that. And then D, from the eyes of the universal form, Surya, the presiding deity of the sun, was created. And thanks to him, we have vision, right? We can see forms. And then E, from the skin of the universal form, came the demigod called Anila. And uh, Anila appears to be just another name for Vayu, right? Since that Anila and Vayu are the same. And this Anila or Vayu controls the wind and also the Tausch. And then from the ears uh, came from the predominating deities of the directions. And these are the deities who preside, preside over the sense of hearing. And from the skin, uh, the deities of sensations appeared. And they are responsible for the sensations derived from uh, the sense of Tausch, including itching also. And then, uh, continues here. And then eight, from the genitalia of the universal form, Brahma manifested the genitals and faculties of reproduction from all living entities. And he himself, Brahma himself, presides over it as the Prajapati. Uh, Brahma is the original living entity, and from his potency, other living entities are generated through you know, sexual intercourse. And then E, uh, Mitra and Indra, were then manifested and they were controlling the function of evacuation and of the hands, right? Indra controls the hands, Mitra, the other part, right? Uh, so from the legs of the universal form, the demigod Vishnu was manifesting, right? Controlling the legs. But this is a different Vishnu. It's not the Supreme Lord. This is just a demigod. And then G, uh, the capacity of understanding is also... Uh, presided over by Brahma, right? Brahma presides over this capacity of understanding things. And it is thanks to him that we can understand the reality around us and acquire knowledge. Yeah. Thanks, Lord Brahma, right? From the heart of the universal form appeared Chandra. This is the demigod of the moon who presides over the mind, right? So, uh, and then El, from the false seal comes Rudra, right? Rudra is an incarnation of Lord Shiva, who presides over the sense of material identity, like the false ego of the living beings that guides their actions. So because of this influence like, of the false ego, the soul in the body of a horse identifies himself with this form and acts like a horse, a man acts like a man, a woman like a woman, and so on. Like right? This false ego creates this identification with the body and makes us uh, act like a body. So when the soul becomes free from these material conceptions and is on the path of remembering, right, his original identity, then the last snare, the last trap 
of material nature is the idea of becoming one with God, right? Uh, and then, and last one, from Mahatattva, material consciousness and the capacity to realize acquired knowledge manifests, right? So this is the creation of the demigods, the senses and activities. Then we have the creation of the planetary systems. So uh, next, Maitreya describes uh, how the different planetary systems and their inhabitants were manifested from this blueprint of the universal form. So A, the heavenly planets were manifested from the head of the universal form, right? The arts and other intermediate planets, they were manifested from the upper part of the legs and Bhuvarloka, that is the space situated in between, uh, was generated from the abdomen. So the lower planetary systems are not mentioned here in this description, they are mentioned later. Uh, but following the logic of this description, they originate from the lower parts of the legs, right? There is a similar description of the different planetary systems in the first chapter of the second canto. But this description from the second canto, it has a different purpose, because this is the description of the Virat Rupa as a guide for yogis meditating, right, in the universal form. Uh, but no. It's, not, it's just a different way to explain it. Just have a different focus. Uh, a more deta detailed description of the different planetary systems will be given later uh, in the following cantos, right? And then uh, B, there are the demigods, right? The demigods, they are situated in the mode of goodness and they live in the higher planetary systems, right? And this includes the demigods living in Swargaloka, like Indra and so on. And as well as, uh, as the great sages living in Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, Brahmaloka, and so on. And then we have the human beings, right, who are predominantly in the mode of passion and live here on art, right? That's us, Jai. So <laughs> Prabhupada mentions in the purport uh, that souls inf influenced by the mode of ignorance, they take birth in the animal kingdom or on the lower planets, right? And then we have D, that uh, that is another class of, of beings, also in the mode of ignorance, but these are beings who become ghosts and other types of followers of Lord Shiva, and they live in Bhuvarloka. Bhuvarloka is a subtle planetary system between art and the celestial planets, right? That's where these associates of, of Lord Shiva live. And then we have... The four social classes, this is also created at this stage. So uh, next, Maitreya describes how the four social classes, they were, they were created, right? So just as the demigods, all human beings and other forms of life, they are parts of the universal form of the Lord, right? So therefore, we are supposed uh, to serve uh, the whole. Right? So animals, automatically, they execute their function, right, according to their natures. And therefore, there is no question of sin for them, right? For animals, they just live. There is no karma for animals, or at least they don't accumulate new karma, because they just follow their natures. They don't have free will. Human beings, however, they have free will, right? And when this free will is properly applied, then a person becomes a pure devotee of the Lord, or at least he performs his duties according to the Varnashrama system. And then he plays his role as a teacher or intellectual, like dedicated to uplifting society, as an ethical politician, as a manager or as a military man, you know, organizing and protecting society. Or he works as some honest farmer or businessman or just as an ordinary honest worker, right? So by accepting the supremacy of the Lord and executing our duties according to this divine system, we can gradually uh, purify ourselves, right? So if we are not going to be pure devotees, then at least we should uh, uh, follow this dharma, follow these duties that are created by the Lord. So uh, this is revealed in the last verse of this section, right? So the four orders are born from the Supreme Lord, and the ultimate goal of this system is to worship the Lord under the guidance of the spiritual master, right? So there is a quote here, uh, 3634. 
said here that all these different social divisions are born with their occupational duties and living conditions from the supreme personality of Godhead. Jai. Thus, for unconditional life and self-realization, one has to worship the Supreme Lord under the direction of the spiritual master, right? Unquote. So this division into four classes with further ramifications is a natural division that can be found in every kind of society, like from Aboriginal tribes to modern countries, everywhere we see these four divisions. The reason is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, 413. Krishna says that according to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. So these divisions, they are present everywhere because they were created by Krishna, right? That's why. So any functional society will naturally organize itself around these four basic uh, divisions. And is it interesting that even communist countries, right, were, which were based on the idea of abolishing social classes, they will develop this natural division over time. It's just unavoidable, right? It's just not possible for a society to function without some form of it, right? The society will just not work. So the point of, so okay, these divisions are natural, okay. We got that. So what is the point about Varnashrama then? Why we need Varnashrama? What's the point? So the point about the Varnashrama system is that Varnashrama is based on the idea of training the members of society, starting from an early age to properly perform their duties. So Brahmanas are thus, you know, enlightened, you know, spiritual teachers instead of just, you know, drunk hearts, you know, passing as professors. Kshatras are saintly kings in, instead of just, you know, obnoxious politicians. The Vaishas, they are unis, uh, they are honest businessmen who share their wealth with the other sectors of society through, you know, proper wages, charity, taxes, and so on. The Shudras, they are disciplined workers, and so on, right? So the idea of Varnashrama is not about creating the divisions because the divisions already exist in any society. The point is about training people so they do their job properly and they, and their society can work properly and be become an enlightened society, right? That's the whole thing about Varnashrama. It's not about division, but about training, uh, right? The division is secondary. The point is training. So, uh, so the soul of the Varnashrama system are the brahmanas, right? Because these are the qualified educators who can train the other classes inside the gurukula system. So without proper gurukulas maintained by qualified teachers, and that's the point. The point is not gurukula. The point is the point are the qualified teachers. You can make gurukula without qualified teachers, but it will just be a disaster. The main thing is qualified teachers. So without proper gurukulas maintained by qualified teachers, Varnashrama is just a pipe dream. It doesn't work. So we can see that at the beginning of our movement, Prabhupada emphasized that he was trying to train some qualified Brahmins, right? Who called uh, guide society. And we can see it starts from there. It starts from having these qualified Brahmins, and then gradually they can train the rest of the society. So just one point about Gurukulas, just since it's mentioned here. So traditionally, Gurukulas, they are small schools which are maintained by a Brahmana family, right? Usually a couple, maybe some children also engaged there. So, uh, so the children of nearby houses or the village, they are educated by these Brahmanas, right? In this protected uh, family environment. So... A Brahmana, together with his wife, he accepts the responsibility of educating a few children and teaches each one according to their natures. So the main characteristic of the system is that there is an effective bond, right, between the uh, teacher and the children. So the children, they are educated by this couple just like their own children, right? So it's a protected environment. It's, not, it's just not like a normal school where you just throw, you know, 200 children and let them, you know, do whatever they want with, you know, two or three teachers trying to control them somewhere, somehow, right? It's different. So the main reason uh, Gurukulas, they have largely failed in our movement is that up to now, we often 
uh, lack qualified teachers. And that's something that is not produced very easily, right? But as we get to know more qualified Brahmanas in our movement, uh, and more of them start to perform their natural role as teachers, the system may start working. But anyway, start from the disqualified Brahmanas. So when somehow all the members of society, they are properly trained, then the system can work properly and this can result in a prosperous and spiritually enlightened uh, society. And then we continue here. So verses 3630 to 3634, they explain the origin of this social, these four social classes, right? So A, uh, Vedic knowledge uh, was manifested from the mouth of the Virat Rupa, right? Just like the faculty of speech. This shows uh, how the perfect use for speech is to recite uh, Vedic knowledge, right? So the ones who are inclined to study and practice this Vedic knowledge are the Brahmanas. And they are the natural teachers and spiritual masters for all the other orders. So the qualities of the Brahmanas are listed uh, by the Lord in the 17th chapter of the 11th canto, right? There, there is a description, more elaborate description of Varnashrama. So there, the qualities for the Brahmanas are described as peacefulness, self-control, austerity, cleanness, satisfaction, tolerance, simple straightforwardness, devotion to the Lord, mercy, and truthfulness, right? And then B, from the arms of the universal form is manifested the power of protection, which is embodied by the kshatras, right? Haribo. Uh, so often we relate being a kshatra with having power and influence and many wives and so on, but this is actually not what means to be a kshatra. The main characteristic of a kshatra, like the defining characteristic, is their capacity and dedication to protect others. That's the point. So both in the material and spiritual sense. So this characteristic, which comes from positive influence of the mode of passion, makes these people, these kshatras, fit to rule society, right? So the qualities of the kshatras are described as dynamic power, bodily strength, determination, heroism, tolerance, generosity, great endeavor, steadiness, devotion to the brahmanas, and leadership, right? Again, 10 qualities. Then, C, the means of subsistence for all or for everyone are generated uh, from the tides of the universal form. So the real means of subsistence are grains and other types of food, right? Which should be distributed to all members of society. We can't eat cars, we can't eat phones, we can't eat computers, right? We can eat only food. So food is the main thing. So this power of maintenance is embodied by the Vaishas, uh, who take charge of producing food and wealth uh, to maintain the whole society, right? So the natural qualities of the Vaishas are listed as faith uh, in Vedic civilization, dedication to charity, freedom from hypocrisy, service to the Brahmanas, and perpetual desire to accumulate more money, right? Jai. <laughs> so these are the Vaishas. Then we have the last one, that are that that from the legs of the Purusha come the Shudras, right? And the Shudras they satisfy the Lord by manual service. So the Shudras they lack these special qualities and initiative of the other classes, but they support the whole society through their honest labor, right? So the qualities of the Shudras are listed as service without duplicity to the Brahmanas, cows, demigods, and other worshipable personalities and complete satisfaction with whatever income is obtained in such service. So, Shabhaktivinoda Thakuram, okay, so how this applies to us, right? Interesting discussion. So, Shabhaktivinoda Thakuram, he mentions that most of us don't didn't receive you know, training in any of the four classes, right? Therefore, we should, at first, try to develop the qualities of a Shudra. Right? And from this, we see if we have the natural inclination for developing the higher qualifications of any of the other three classes. So the Lord lists the qualities of persons who are not trained in the Varnashrama system as 
dirtiness, dishonesty, thievery, faithlessness, useless quarrel, lust, anger, and hankering. And yeah, these qualities are very common nowadays. Like maybe we ourselves may have a few of these qualities. So you see, these qualities, they are symptom of someone who is an old caste. He is not trained to be part of the Varnashrama system. He's lower than a shudra, right? So that's why uh, uh, that's how we start our lives. So that's why Bhaktivinoda Thakura, he says that first you try to be a shudra, try to develop the qualities of a shudra, the good qualities of a shudra. And from there, then you see if you can, you know, uh, develop something more. So these are the qualities of someone who is not trained, right? who is outside of the Varnashrama, and then there are the basic qualities for all members of the Varnashrama system. And these are qualities for everyone, Vaishas, Shudras, women, everyone, right? Uh, Brahmanas and Kshatras, of course. And these qualities are non-violence, truthfulness, honesty, desire for the happiness and welfare of all others, as well as freedom from lust, anger, and greed. Right? So, see, these are the basic qualities for anyone who uh, uh, who is going to be part of the Varnashrama system. So, you see, when we imagine a society where everyone has these qualities as a minimum and, other, and some have higher qualities even, then we imagine a, a, a Varnashrama society, right? So, that's what really Varnashrama society is. It's about training the members to develop these qualities, right? It's not just about, you know, stamping people as this or that. So the idea is that we first need to develop this basic set of qualities, then the qualities of a shudra, right? Remember, the shudra has two extra qualities, right? So just again, uh, so non-violence, truthfulness, honesty, desire for the happiness and welfare of all others, as well as freedom from lust, anger, and greed. These are the basic qualities. And then... Shudra has two more. Um, uh, 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 service without duplicity to the Brahmanas, cows, demigods, and their worship and other worshipable or worshipable personalities, and complete satisfaction with whatever income is obtained in such service. Right? So Shudra has two extra qualities. And then Vaisha has more extra qualities, Kshatra more, Brahmana more. So yeah. So that's the, the whole point, right? We need to focus on developing these qualities, starting from ourselves, right? That's that's the main point. We can't, you know, demand others to do something that we ourselves are not doing. Uh, so Maitreya finishes his explanation by hinting that the purpose of the Varnashrama system and also the means for establishing this divine system in this day and age is the process of hearing and glorifying the Lord. So Maitreya says that, quote, the highest perfectional gain of humanity is to engage in discussions of the activities and glories of the pious actor, means the Lord. Such activities are so nicely arranged in writing by the great learned sages that the actual, that the actual purpose of the year is served just by being near them, right? Jai. So, it is not possible to establish Varnashrama just as a set of rules. It is necessary to somehow elevate people to the necessary standard of consciousness, right? So, as long as we are, you know, dirty, dishonest, faithless, quarreling, lustful, angry, and so on, then there is no question of, you know, developing, you know, function of Varnashrama society, right? It becomes possible only when we become first purified by hearing about the Lord, singing His glories, right? Serving Him. So, as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam 5, 18, 12, one who develops firm devotion to the Lord manifests the qualities of the demigods, such as religion, knowledge, and renunciation. So, you see, the only process to really develop these necessary qualities that we studied here are by seriously practicing Krishna consciousness, right? It's not possible to develop these qualities by any other means. So the process of hearing about Krishna and chanting his name, uh, they can thus help us to develop these basic human qualities and from there establish 
a proper society based on spiritual values, right? So this process of establishing Varnashrama does, it passes through first becoming Krishna conscious, that, right? and then once as we, as devotees, they develop this saintly qualities that are expected from our spiritual practice, then our communities, they can gradually evolve into places where devotees, they behave honestly, they cooperate, and so on, right? And then from this, we will have an opportunity to develop a function of our national system based on qualified individuals and gradually teach others, right? So, okay, so this is it for today. Uh, we had a lot here uh, today, right? <laughs> Quite a long topic. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my obeisances, our glorious Shishila Prabhupada, right? Ah, Krishna Nangish wrote here in the chat that uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Today was a very serious topic, <laughs> but with the explanations, they were very interesting. Okay, thank you. And Alev Tina, Hare Krishna, thank you. I will be waiting for the recording. Yes, the recording will be coming and also the uh, notes, right? The transcript. So you can uh, study again later. So, okay. Hare Krishna, thank you very much for coming. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Gora Premanande. Haribo.